Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and I am here with Cami Lewis Levin. And we're going to talk about something that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, that is, quote, uh, balancing your life, right? That that dreaded work-life balance. And is it a real thing or not? Is it something we can achieve? Are we looking at it from the wrong angle? So we're going to jump into that, especially for those of us who are women and moms and trying to to keep everything together. Uh, But before we do that, I would love to find out, uh, Cami, a little bit about you, about your background. I know that uh, you are also a mom. You have learned how to balance all these things in your life. You're, You're a professional. You are a college professor and you also run a company. So I'd love to hear how all of that came to be and how it all fits together for you. Yeah, I'm a professional balancer. (laughs) (laughs) So you were talking about work-life balance and I definitely think that that is not a real thing. That's not something that we can achieve. Um, My friend Callie Yost, who writes for this well-known magazine about these kinds of issues calls it work-life fit. And that makes a lot more sense to me because it's every week looks different. Every month looks different. And you just have to do your best to make things fit together in a way that feels like the life that you want to live. Right. My, I know that this is a podcast for musicians. My, my life before this was as a dancer. I was a dancer for a really long time. Um, I went through performing arts schools. I thought I was going to be a professional dancer. And then I got hurt and I had to kind of make a decision about what I was going to do. The orthopedic surgeon said, you can have surgery and continue dancing, or you cannot have surgery and stop dancing. Um, So I decided to have surgery and then I stopped dancing. (laughs) So (laughs) I, my, my consequently, my, my second life, Um, has been in the field of education and primarily in K through 12. But what I realized was that my, my passion and my, my deep love is really about adult learning. And so I started doing coaching and leadership development work, both in the education space and outside of the education space and kind of discovered that my favorite people to work with were working moms who were really struggling with their work-life fit, particularly moms in leadership positions, however you want to define that. And the experience that I had as a working mom leader that kind of led me to this point of feeling almost a calling to support women in, in this arena was that um, I had been I had been um, promoted very, very quickly um, in a nonprofit that I was working in, and I was promoted with zero support around leadership development. I had never hired anyone. I had never um, supported a team. I had choreographed pieces and I had, um, you know, worked with others in a collaborative setting, but I had never managed or evaluated or um, worked with others in that way. And I loved it and it was incredibly stressful. And um, I developed this cough that was an alarming cough, but because I was so deep into like my work and my, um, my identity as a leader, I kept you know, I don't have time to go to the doctor. I don't have time to go to the doctor. I don't have time to go to the doctor. And then I I woke up one morning and I thought I was having a heart attack and um, it turned out that I had pneumonia 
And um, so luckily it wasn't a heart attack, but because I had put off seeing someone about that cough for so long, it had um, turned into a pretty serious pneumonia, it left quite a scar on my lung. And um, it really made me rethink my priorities, how I was balancing work and life and what people need in terms of support in order to live their best lives at work and at home. So that's um, kind of what brought me to this in a nutshell. Wow. And so where, where in the timeline did you have your children? So um, that event happened about 10 years ago. I had two boys um, at the time they were five and seven. And very shortly after that, I had my third child. And it was a really interesting time because I, I got this pneumonia. Then almost, um, almost immediately, I became pregnant with my third child. And I was in such a state of like amygdala hijack and high alert and high anxiety that um, the decisions that I was making were like retrospectively absurd. Um, and so the prime example of this was I had a baby and then I went straight into a doctoral program oh. while con continuing to be a leader in, in this job that I was having no support around. And so to me, that that looking back 10 years ago, my kids are now 17, 15 and almost nine. It's It's a very clear indication that if you're not focused on how you're fitting together your work and your life as a survival mechanism, your brain just, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't work properly. And the decisions that you make are um, impulsive and reactionary and um, generally ill thought out, even if you think that you're spending the time and really processing and really trying to make good decisions. If that's the headspace that you're in, it's, it's not possible. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, your brain is in a way trying to protect you. That's right. So after you had this experience with, you know, the, the cough and the pneumonia and all of that stuff, how and when did you start to make this change to try to figure out how to make a better fit with your work and life? Yeah. So um, I was very convinced that I could do it all. That was how I had, that's how we're conditioned. That's how we're socialized, right? I could, I could do everything. And having 24 hours in a day was like ha, 24 hours. I can turn that 24 hours into 48 hours. I lived in New York city at the time. And my husband still makes fun of me um, because I have this notion that you can get anywhere in the city in 20 minutes, which is like, absolutely not true. <laughs> but um, this idea that like you, we can't see our own limitations. And, um, and so I was in this doctoral program and I had a baby and I had a very high powered, um, leadership position. And I had two boys that were school-aged and I had my, uh, marriage that was very rocky at that time. And, um, I, this is after the pneumonia. I really, I thought that I was going to have a nervous breakdown. I really did. Um, and so I made a couple of really crucial decisions. I wanted to stay in my doctoral program. And in order to do that, I knew that I had to create a different work situation. And so I um, stepped down from that position and I took a job with another organization. Um, and it was my first foray into remote work. Mm -hmm. And um, I found that that worked really well for me. It was a lower level of responsibility. I wasn't um, I wasn't in charge of or caring for a large team of people. Um, I was doing program development and facilitation. And so um, it was just less intense. It provided me with more flexibility. And, um, you know, my feeling was I'm going to do this until I finish my 
doctoral program. And then um, my schooling will open up other options for me. And, and that's what happened. So I think, you know, I realized that I perform better as a mother, as a leader, and as a person when I have more control over my schedule, when I have a more um, flexible calendar, and when I have choice. Mm. And I don't think that's specific to me. I think that is pretty general. Um, So yeah, I mean, my husband prefers to work in person. He prefers to have um, nine to five-ish type hours. He thrives in that kind of a structure. And so I know that there are people that prefer to work that way. Just it took me a really long time to to be okay with it because I think it indicated to me that I wasn't enough. I wasn't perfect enough. I wasn't um, being ambitious in the right ways and that somehow it was a failure on my part. And so it took a while for me to kind of own that like, no, actually I'm leading in a different way. I'm working in a different way and it's working better for me and for my family. Yeah, I completely get that. But, you know, there's this idea that maybe if you do that, then certain jobs are just not open to you. You know, like they're not going to hire you remote to run a huge team or, you know, and you have to be okay with that. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I think that's actually a really important lesson because we tend to think that we are, we we tend to operate as if we are like a pawn in this game of life. And that's, that's a, that's an example of a choice that we can make, right? I will never apply for that kind of a job again. It doesn't work for me. It doesn't, it's not what I want. And so knowing that actually creates a freedom for me um, because it's, it's, it's my choice. I don't feel like I have to do that. I There are plenty of opportunities that don't require me to be in an office or to be working um, 70 hours, 80 hours a week, you know? Yeah, and it, it depends on where you want to get your f- fulfillment from. So a That's lot right. of the musicians that are listening or watching this, uh, people in my community, I know, have left major corporate jobs whether it's to pursue music, to be home with their children, and then try to pursue music that way. That's kind of what happened to me um, to, you know, to retire. So then they can focus on music. But then I think they get into this freelance world where they don't have either someone telling them when to come to work, what to do, or responsibility to do that for others. (laughs) And they feel a little lost. Like they feel like, their calendar is just like this, this like open space that they don't know what to put where, how how did you start doing that coming from that work world? That's a great question. Um, And that's a terrifying place to be. Um, There are a couple of things that I did. Uh, I transitioned into remote work. And then after several years of that, I transitioned into Um, being a consultant and being self-employed. And in a lot of ways, being a self-employed person is effectively freelance, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But because I had the scaffolding of working in person then working remotely, having nothing to do with COVID, and then um, moving into into this phase, I, I was able to kind of figure out some things that worked really well for me. From a calendar perspective, I think there's a very fine line between ritualizing a routine and totally overcomplicating your life. (laughs) So um, there are certain schedule markers that I have every week that are consistent every week that I never miss. And that that's what I do. Um, For example, 
three mornings a week, I drop my nine-year-old daughter off at school. So I know that between 7.30 and 8.30, I'm going to be otherwise engaged. And I put that in my calendar. Similarly, twice a week, I pick my daughter up from school. And so that's always in my calendar. And so that because me making the decision that I'm prioritizing, picking her up and dropping her off on those days creates a um, a container for me to work within. And that that's something that works really well for me. If I have the container, then I can determine how I'm going to use my time within the container and um, when I'm going to stop working, what evenings I'm going to continue working. Um, so there are a couple of those. There's dropping off and picking up my daughter. There is working out. So I have um, identified time on my calendar every week, and it's always the same of that time, and it's sacred time, and that's what happens. Um, and then I, I have, it sounds ridiculous, but I, I have a dog, um, and so I have to walk the dog every day in the middle of the day, and that creates a container too. And so I have found that if I can put these markers in my calendar, and then there's white space around those markers, I'm much more efficient because I know that I have a four hour block here or a two hour block here. And um, I can decide and prioritize what the best use of time is for that particular hour block. And then kind of planning backwards from deadlines. So if I have, um, you all have performances, my performances are um, session facilitation. So I'll know when I have sessions that I'm going to be facilitating and then be able to plan backwards and use those blocks to create content, create agendas, practice, um, meet with whoever I need to meet with and, and that sort of thing. And how are you planning that? Like how far out are you re kind of reverse engineering? Like say you have this session and it's next Friday, then how early are you kind of going and saying, okay, I need to get ready for that. Let me block these things in. So I have a couple of different layers. Um, usually my big sessions are booked at least a month in advance. Mm. And I know that if I'm facilitating a full day session, I'm going to need at least two full days to prep for that session. And so um, so I do that kind of backwards planning. I also want to carve out a full day to reflect on how that session went afterwards. And so I, I really try to, based on what's coming up, to craft my calendar such that it supports whatever preparation has to happen and whatever debrief has to happen. And um and that's been really helpful to me. I, generally, a rule of thumb for me is that it takes um, twice as long to prep as the actual session. So if I'm running an hour long session, it takes about two hours for me to prep it. If I'm running a four hour session, it takes about eight hours for me to prep it. If I'm running a day long session, it's about two days worth of time that it takes for me. To, and it's just a rule of thumb. Sometimes it's much more if it's content that I've presented before, it takes less time, you know, but um, that's how I carve out my calendar for the week or the month leading up to the event. Now, that's a good rule of thumb. And I'm thinking with musicians and performances, they can think that way too. You know, and of course, depending on whether it's new material or you've got new musicians that you're working with versus stuff that you've done, you know, a lot, then you don't have as much prep, but you still need to set aside that time because you can't just go into it cold. Yeah. And I have found that people don't allow themselves that time. It's like the first time to go, well, I don't really need that time because it's just my prep time. And I have found that that that's the work, right? Like if you're, yeah. if you're performing the prep time, the rehearsal, the, um, <clears throat> the practice is the work that you need to do in order to be successful in that, in that space. And um, so in my coaching work with um, 
people in leadership positions, it's just fascinating to me how they think they can just go into a meeting and like shoot from the hip or, you know, talk off the cuff or just, you know, they'll be fine. They'll be fine. They've done this a million times and being really intentional about how you're carving um, in education, we call it um, intellectual preparation. Mm. If, if you're really intentional about how you're planning your, in, your um, intellectual preparation, you are much more confident and the session goes much more smoothly than if you think you're just going to be like doing it off the cuff. Yeah, totally. I mean, my husband's an English professor, so, you know, there are classes he's taught many times, but he still has to go over his notes before he goes and teaches a class, even if it's a class he's taught every semester. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It it gives you peace of mind. Um, and it also, I find that it helps me to, to think about what my priorities are. Mm-hmm. The session facilitation is you know, arguably the most important part of my work. And so if I'm not devoting the prep time to it, that it requires, I'm, what am I saying to myself about that aspect of my work? And what am I saying to the people who are paying me for that work? It's not, it's not fair to me and it's not fair to them. And so for a long time, it felt this is also going to sound ridiculous, but it felt selfish to me to carve out that kind of prep time because I could do it late at night or I could do it, you know, while I was driving or like I could try to fit it in in other places. It was time that I needed to like feel okay about the work. And so there was like a mindset shift there around, no, that, that, that's actually the work. And I don't need to make this phone call or send this email or um, spend 85 years Googling something to have the right research to present. Um, I actually need to build the session and practice the session and make sure that the session makes sense and um, poke holes in it so that I'm I'm presenting my best self and my best, best work. Yeah. Yeah, I I think that's really good because for musicians, sometimes practice does feel like either indulgence or like unnecessary or, you know, like, am I a real musician if I actually need to practice? (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I think it's part of this like sort of larger conversation around, I'm really not into the term self-care, but this idea that if you're doing something for yourself, it's selfish. And practicing your craft or practicing your, your preparing for your work is not selfish, right? It's like actually how you run your business. Right. And it doesn't say anything about your aptitude. You know what I mean? No. Some people just feel like, well, I should just be able to go in there and do it because I've done it a million times, but. But there's always something to learn. There's yeah. always something to tweak. And the more you do it, the more on autopilot you can become so that you can be attuned to other things you know it frees up it frees up brain space it frees up kind of cognitive load yes yes and that's very true especially for like singing you know the more you practice the more things can kind of work in the background and you can focus more on you know communicating with the audience and things that's like right. that important that's things. right So let me ask you about rituals around your work. So we talked about, you know, kind of having those containers. Do you have different rituals, times you block out for specific things that you need to do weekly? Because I always encourage musicians, you know, block out time for admin, block out time for booking. So you actually do it and it's on your calendar. Do you have those kinds of things in your calendar or do you like, you know, weekly or are you just planning your week every week? So it depends on the thing, but there are certain administrative um, responsibilities that I do carve out time for. For example, um, I send out email campaigns every every week. And so every Monday morning, I carve out a couple of hours to make sure that the emails are done and automated and ready to be sent out for that week. 
And then the following Monday, I'll go back and look at the metrics and look how, you know, see how the emails perform, see how many clicks, whatever. Um, and I will revise my next week's emails accordingly. Um, and I feel like that actually saves me time because if you are sending, if you're manually sending out emails every day, it can be like the biggest time suck ever. Mm -hmm. So um, those are specific to my business. Um, I also try to, part of my work is um, individual coaching. So I try to have consistent um, appointments with the people that I'm coaching. So every Thursday morning at eight o'clock, I'm coaching Brandon and every Wednesday at two, I'm coaching Fred. And um, that I find really helpful both for me and for the people that I'm coaching. And I think um, it applies to rehearsal or practice as well, right? If you have a consistent time, if you're not planning in advance for a particular event, but you still need to practice and, um, and like get your shit together, having a particular time during the week or during the day that is specifically devoted to that is really helpful. Yeah, I definitely recommend that too. And then if they're teaching, like you were kind of talking about the coaching thing, like if they're coaching or teaching, having kind of a consistent schedule around that too. So then you can, you can see where the, the, the white space is, and then you can fill it in. Um, I'm curious, do you keep some spots white? Cause I've, I've experienced, you know, some people just love like doing all the planning on their calendar and knowing what they're doing when, and some people, they look at their calendar and if there's like not very much white space, they like have a panic attack. <laughs> yeah. So I, I have found that too. And for me personally, it gives me a great deal of anxiety and agita to have a full back-to-back -back calendar. I need the white space because to me, it's like, it's like a, a mental note that I have flexibility. And, and if I don't get to something that was scheduled on my calendar, um, in a, in a not white space, I can move it to the white space. You know, like if you get caught up in something or if, um, there's a family emergency, or if um, you get a phone call that you weren't expecting, there's room to move stuff around. I find it very overwhelming to have a fully fleshed out calendar with no white space. Um, from like a, an emotional standpoint, it, it like, I find it disturbing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I definitely have talked to people that, that feel that way. And, and I'm starting to be that way. If I look and I see that I've got, you know, like on my Fridays, I usually have my interviews and, and some training sessions. And I look today and I'm like, oh my gosh, interview, training session, uh, coaching client, training session, phone call with a partner and another phone call with a partner. I'm like, oh, you know, I'm looking at that going, that's a lot, but it really isn't. It's like not more than I normally do in a day. Something about just seeing those, you know, straight down on my calendar is stressful. Um, so I think there is, you have to figure out what works for you and, and I'm okay with it for like one day of the week, but if every day of the week was like that, I would not be happy. So I think yeah. figuring out, figuring out what, what works well for you of maybe having like a day like that. And then like a day where you have a lot more white space. I think there's also a difference between your calendar and your to-do list mm -hmm. and you don't have to throw everything from your to-do list into your calendar. It's okay. If you don't drop off the dry cleaning at one o'clock on Friday, you don't need to, you know, pencil that in necessarily. I have found that, um, in my travel time, if I can list some of the things, some of those errands or things that I have to take care of in travel time, then it's sort of top of mind. And I'm like, Oh, I'm, I'm driving by CVS right now. Anyway, I can get that medication picked mm -hmm. up or um, I'm, I'm going to be driving past the grocery store. I can get the milk at that time. And I have found that that ends up saving me time. Um, and it also makes it easier to not conflate the to-do list with the calendar. Yeah, that makes sense. So that being said, how do you keep track of your to-dos and how do you do you prioritize them? You know, like do you go through them every week and kind of prioritize them or every day? How do you make sure that the thing just doesn't 
become this overwhelming massive list? Yeah. I mean, that's a really good question. I am definitely not a compliance driven person. I, and I think, and I'm not a detail oriented person. So I know those things about myself. <laughs> um, Which is good. Cause I think there's plenty of musicians out here that are are more like, I like to lovingly call them scattered creatives because yeah. they're very creative and, very, you know, they have a million ideas a second, but they aren't very detail oriented when it comes to like administrative or things like that. Yeah. I find it to be the, the hardest and the most annoying, crappiest aspect of my life. Um, but like things have to get done. Right. And so I, there are a couple of ways that I deal with it. Um, and I, I don't know that I would recommend any of these ways, like, but it, it seems to work for me. One is bundling stuff. So um, like you were saying, like identifying a day and kind of throwing all of the administrivia into that day and then you just move on with your life. Um, I'll give you an example. I both of, we have two cars and um, they both needed to be serviced. And so I identified a, a week this week where I was going to deal with both of the cars being serviced and and I blocked out a day for each of the cars because you know when you take your car into the shop they say it's going to take an hour and it takes you know a week um and that's exactly what happened but I was really proud of myself because I had already blocked in the time and so I was able to get both of the cars serviced nobody was inconvenienced. My husband wasn't inconvenienced. I wasn't inconvenienced. My children weren't inconvenienced. And, um, and now those things are taken care of and I don't have to think about it again for a year. Um, I do that with like dentist appointments too. I'll make all five of our dentist appointments like on the same day Mm -hmm. or in the same two day period, because my, like from a cognitive load perspective, I can't function if the next five weeks I have to remember a dentist appointment for each person, or if the dentist appointments are happening over the course of the next three months, there are five of us, we all need appointments. We're all going to get it done today. And then I'm not going to think about it again for a year. Um, that, that kind of bundling tends to work well for me. It drives my husband nuts. Um, but he's not making the appointments I am. So, right. Yeah, I know that used to happen naturally for me because I lived up in the mountains and we had to go down like an hour down to do a lot of things, you know, even go to yeah. Costco and stuff, you know, go to the dentist and all that. And so we would have like, okay, it's a Fresno day. We're all going down there, you know, and it was annoying, but it was also like, wow, I just wiped a lot of things off my to-do list in one day, which is kind of yeah. Yeah. And um, I just recently learned about sort of a complimentary thing called temptation bundling. Mm. So um, if you can bundle all of the crap that you have to get done, but then there's some sort of like a extrinsic reward at the end, like I'm going to run all of my errands and then I'm going to, um, you know, get myself this thing or I, I'm obsessed with Australian licorice, Australian black licorice. And so like if I, I, I hate having to go to the drugstore 15 times in one week. And if I can bundle it all together, um, my reward to myself will be, I'm going to buy myself a bag of black licorice and I'm going to eat that whole thing. And it's going to make me very happy. So um, that's, that is something that I learned recently, this idea of temptation bundling. Yeah. I love that too. I, I kind of trick myself sometimes with that kind of thing. Like, well, I want to listen to say an audio book or a podcast, mm-hmm. but I can only do it when I'm exercising or walking yep. or something. Yeah. Yeah. Or doing the gives, laundry. Totally. And it gives your brain like this little kick of serotonin because you're doing something for yourself, but it's okay to do it because you're getting all of this other stuff done. Yep. And then, so how do you for say like things for your family, I know you're talking about errands and stuff, but I know as a mom, you know, when my kids were little, it was like, oh, I have to help them with homework in the afternoons or the evenings. And they have gate, you know, soccer practice and all that. How do you build that into your schedule? Yeah. So my older son is, um, 
he's working on college applications, which involves like a ton of administrivia that was not part of my life last year. Um, <laughs> so just using that as an example, um, I need to make sure that I touch base with him every single day in a face-to-face -face conversation to make sure that certain things are getting done. And like I said, I'm not I'm not a detail oriented person. So this is like a huge um, stretch for me. Um, but I make sure that I can have the face to face conversations with him because for me, having the face to face is helpful because I don't I don't have to remember everything. I it, seeing him kind of triggers like a list of things that we have to go through. And, um, and it also makes it so that I'm not texting him every five seconds and being like, did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? So I think it's less annoying to him and, um, adds like a, a degree of connection, you know, um, in terms of like the driving around, I, I have to say that the best, one of the, one of the few best things about living in Florida, um, is that, you know, Florida is a very complicated state. Um, when my son turned 16, he got his driver's license and him being able to drive himself and his brother to things like water polo practice has changed my life, mm -hmm. like literally and legitimately changed my life. So, um, those kinds of things have been kind of taken off my plate, but prior to that, it was more bundling you know, like they have to be in this place. So I'm going to get these errands done while I'm waiting for them to finish at this thing. And then we'll come home really trying to be as time efficient as possible. Yep. Yep. And and that's really what you have to do when you have people going in so many different directions. Yeah. And it does, it does change your life when your, your teenager gets their driver's license. It's like, yeah, amazing. it's, it's, yeah. I can't even tell you how grateful I am. <laughs> yep, yep, I remember that. Um, so why don't you tell our audience, like, how do you, I know you work with moms and, um, and professionals to, or to kind of balance their life or best fit, as you said earlier, uh, can you tell people how you work with others? Yeah, sure. So, um, I have a, a very flourishing Facebook community, um, it's called the Fierce Working Moms Leadership Circle. And so if you look for it on Facebook, you can like sign up and I'll approve you and um, you'll just, and we share a lot of content. We talk about um, fierce working mom life. Um, it's, it's, there's a lot of humor involved, but also a lot of like social emotional um, stuff like locus of control and like. Um, those limitations that we were talking about, like, no, you can't actually get everywhere in New York City in 20 minutes. That's not a thing. Um, and it's helpful to have a space to have those conversations. Um, I'm launching a new program on October 1st, and I'm looking for, there are only 10 spots. So I'm looking for um, people to recruit. It's an eight week program that's really focused on mindset and leadership development for women who are ready to kind of look behind their own veil and look at how they deal with boundaries and how they deal with self-awareness and how they get in their own way. And it, things don't have to be as hard as they feel. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm really excited about that program. I've had, I've had great success with it in the past. Um, and I have a podcast which is on Spotify and it's also called, uh, fierce working mom leadership circle. And we, I just recorded the eighth episode today and, um, every episode is me interviewing a working mom in a leadership position, which is very broadly defined and how they do what we've been talking about, um, over the course of this conversation, how they manage it all, how they see themselves, what makes them happy, how they create space for all of the things that they have to get done. And um, 
I don't know, I have found these, for me, these interviews have been incredibly illuminating because it's, we feel so alone and isolated so much. And there's like this ridiculous standard that as a working mom, you have to meet. And like, sometimes, you know, you're not wearing makeup and sometimes you're running around like a sweaty mess and sometimes, you know, and, and like, and that's just the way it is. And you may think that that mom has her shit together and um, nobody does. And so I find these interviews to be really validating in that way. Yeah, I definitely, I mean, I find that with, with this show and the, the working musicians that I've had on here and people seeing that it actually can be done um, is so encouraging to them. So I love that you're doing that. So that is a fierce working mom circle. Is that right? Leadership circle. Yeah. Fierce, fierce working, working moms, moms leadership circle. So you guys yeah. go check that out. You're obviously listening to a podcast or watching this. So you love podcasts. So check that out and go check out her Facebook group. That will be a great place for you to get some validation and be able to have some conversations with some other badass working mom women. So Thanks so much, Cammie. This has been really great. I always love talking about time management and productivity and how how we can do it all without totally burning out. We can't do it all, obviously, but we can manage it all and decide what is prioritizing what's most important without burning ourselves out. It's all about making hard choices. It is. It is. So thank you. Thank you so much. much. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.